through January as transportation professionals. And uh, a number of us in this room, which I'll be speaking of in a little bit, um, are also uh, landscape architects who practice in transportation. But um, just want to remind everyone that if you have ideas, please uh, share this. We can we can do this again in the future. Uh, we like to do this every year, I believe. And um, also, if you're thinking of pre uh, presenting at our annual meeting, our annual conference in Miami in October, uh, the deadline to get your presentation uh, suggestions or proposals in is January uh, 23rd. So do keep that in mind. Um, I feel like I should move forward. I'm going to let this sit up here while I talk just a little bit more. This is our mission, vision, values, and culture. Um, as the Society of Landscape Architects. We are a membership-based organization. Um, so do become a member if you are not already. You can, as a landscape architect, but also as an affiliated member. Um, these are the kinds of things we provide. Education, uh, fellowship, uh, also advocacy on your behalf. Um, and in transportation, we have a professional practice network uh, that specializes uh, in transportation issues. Um, and, you know, lots of information about complete streets, green infrastructure, so uh, do become involved. Uh, so let me move on just a bit. So the other reason that this is a great tie-in for me is that I come every year with my Transportation uh, Research Board Committee, AFB 40, the Committee on Landscape and Environmental Design. I found this committee. Hello, everyone in the room who's here tonight that's a member of our committee, clap or raise your hands. I don't know, something. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. Uh, yes, you can raise your hand. Yeah. So we, uh, I found this group uh, about 15 years ago. It's like I found my people because uh, landscape architects uh, that are practicing transportation, either in public sector, private sector, um, this is where you go to essentially support our profession in terms of research. I mean, we are really promoting research uh, for transportation and the environment. Uh, we have three major categories of research we work on. We work in the community, uh, promoting systems that enhance the visual and perceptive quality livability uh, of the economy. So uh, if you're doing any of work in that uh, sector, just think about us as an opportunity. Uh, we have research needs statements that cover all of these things. Of course, the environment, proponing stewardship of the natural environment, natural environment. Um, and so all of these things are under our purview and uh, we support research or at least put it forward for funding with the National Academy of Sciences. And then uh, obviously function and design, uh, maintaining uh, and enhancing the mobility and access of the transportation system. So um, become involved both with ASLA and the Transportation Research Board. So tonight I just want to say I am uh, as of November, I believe, the president of ASLA. It's a pretty amazing thing. I don't know how I quite got here, but here I am. So, uh, but I want to introduce our other panelists and move forward because it's going to be a really exciting night. So right here to my right is Nico Larco, uh, who's a AIA. He's a registered landscape architect. I mean, you're a registered architect, I'm sure. A good landscape um, I'm going to move into the light a little more. Uh, Nico is a professor of architecture at the University of Oregon and is the director of Urbanism Next a nationally and internationally awarded multidisciplinary organization that focuses on sustainability issues as they relate to the built environment. Professor Nardko's research focuses on, in, includes sustainable urban design and how technology, technological advances are changing city form and development. Next, we have Sakina Khan, the Deputy Director of Citywide Strategy and Analysis for the DC Office of Planning. Uh, Ms. Khan oversees the state data center, geographic information systems, as well as systems planning related to housing, transportation, sustainability, economic development, and capital facilities. That's a heck of a portfolio, I'm just <laughs> going to say. Uh, Ms. Khan was previously at the Office of Planning and Senior Planning Senior Economic Planner, specializing in economic development analysis with a focus on emerging sectors and neighborhoods. And then just to her right is Kevin Ray, a landscape architect, ASLA. Thank you very much. Uh, the Deputy Director of Landscape Architecture at Tool Design. Uh, Ken Ray has a broad range of experience on multimodal transportation planning and design from complex urban design projects to large statewide and national initiatives. Ken is passionate about creating exceptional experiences in the public realm, from streetscapes to trails, plazas to parks. He has a keen understanding of the importance of design details and how they contribute to experiential qualities of place. And I just want to also mention, he rode his bike from Silver Spring to Crystal City and then here. 
That's amazing. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand this over. I think, and I am off off stage or in the chair. Thank you. I stand over here. Yes. Great, great. So thanks so much. So uh, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to, to do this. I'm thankful for Wendy for the introduction and um, uh, uh, Katie, thank you for organizing all this. So uh, I'm, as was mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of Oregon. I'm going to work in urban design, uh, with professor of architecture, uh, and I'm director of this Urban and Next Center. And at Urban and Next, we're really interested in the impacts of um, new mobility, autonomous vehicles, and e commerce, uh, the impacts it's going to have on cities. So looking at things uh, from how does it affect everything from land use to street design to neighborhood design to land values to um, equity concerns to environmental concerns? We're less interested in, the, in those uh, technologies we are to have to affect the things we all care about. Right? Um, so, uh, what I'm going to do, uh, my role today was to kind of set the context of what's happening uh, and some of the impacts, and then we're going to uh, see a little bit uh, more about five pieces of this and then have a conversation. Um, so when you if you Google uh, future cities or the future of cities, you get images like this, and we look at that and we think to ourselves, uh, like that's Blade Runner, and there's a whole bunch of like you know, people in turtlenecks living in that thing. So we that we think, um, our cities don't look like that, so we're okay. We're not in the future. We're in today, and everything's fine. So we can keep doing everything just the same way that we've always done. The problem is that the future of the city looks like this. Uh, this is uh, in Arizona and in, in Phoenix. We're in Chandler, Arizona. Waymo, which is Google's autonomous vehicle arm, is running what's called level four automation. These are cars that do not need anyone in the front seat. That exists right now, today, in um, in Arizona. And it's not simply like that they're testing it. They have a whole, it's not open for the entire public, but it's not just their employees. There's a whole the cohort of people who've been selected families who call up the way you call up an Uber or Lyft, and a car shows up with nobody in it, they get in and it takes them around the city. That is happening right now, right? So the problem is that we look at this and we're like, that looks like our cities and we should keep doing everything that we're doing because you know there's a lot of work that needs to happen to fix what some of the things we see in here. Um, oh, they have transit, and this is like one of the few of transit in the group. Um, but um, it, everything has changed. This is changing all these things that we cannot keep doing this, the things that we're doing. So, as I mentioned, we look at, and I'll talk about some of those things that have changed. We look at ABs and new mobility. And by new mobility, I mean um, transportation network companies that's Uber and Lyft. We're talking about micro transit, Uber and Via. We're talking about micro mobility. That's things like scooters and bikes, right? All these kind of new ways of moving around and what kind of impacts they're going to have. We look at e commerce, as I mentioned, and we look at somewhat of the sharing economy. As I mentioned before, we're less interested in those top things we're really interested in. How does that affect the city? Right? How does that change the way that we're so to give you a sense of where we're at and how much how much things are changing. TNCs, transportation network companies that Uber or Lyft, last year, 4.2 billion trips happened in the US. Sorry, just say two years ago, 2018. 2019, that was our now we have 4.2 billion trips. Ten years ago, it didn't exist, right? That's a tremendous amount of growth over a small amount of time. Uh, this thing called scooters, which landed in uh, in somewhere in 2018, by the end of 2018, there were 30 mil 38 million rides. To give you a sense, bike share in the US, which you know, I have a bike ride myself, I love bike share exists. This existed more or less for nine years in the country. And in 2018, 36 million trips. Right? Over all those years, it got to 36. Scooters in less than one year got to 38. Right? Huge amount of growth. And AV is level four automation that's happening right now. To give you a sense of, if you don't, Track this a lot. Um, last year, uh, actually two years ago, and then again uh, in part of last year, Waymo has ordered a total of 82,000 vehicles. They put purchase in, in for 82,000 vehicles, and this of no, November, uh, late October of last year, started a plant in Detroit that takes a car, Pacific, uh, right to Pacific Advance, and, uh, and um, uh, Jaguar uh, cars, and makes them into a car vehicle. Right, eighty-two thousand. They don't want to sell them to you. They want to. They want to run the fleets, right? So the idea is that they're going to one day be like, "We're ready. We can deal with DC. Here's four thousand vehicles." Right. So these things are. It's happening right now, and they will be arriving in step fashion. It's not going to be uh, slow. Um, but 
e-commerce is taking off all over the country. It's now about 14% of the amount of, uh, of the retail that we do, 14% growing tremendously. Um, every year, year over year, the last few years, it's been somewhere between six and 9% reduction in the number of people who walk into a store based on large amount of e-commerce, right? Huge reduction in the number of people. We have, last year was the largest number of stores closing in the history of the country. Uh, the two before that were the two previous years before that, right? So the world is changing quickly. Um, 15 billion e-commerce packages, billion with a B, were delivered last year in the United States, right? That translates to 118 packages per household on average, just one every three days. So think about the implications of everything from how things are getting delivered to uh, what's going on in the street corner to where what store I didn't go to to what my transportation patterns look like, this is affecting everything in real time. So if that just sets the context of, and this is a really quick kind of cover of those things are happening, what are the impacts in the city? So I'm gonna give you just a couple of impacts really quickly, and the, the hope is just to stimulate some thinking about this with a ton more information, but just to get to think about it. One of the largest things that we see uh, the potential for impact is on parking. Um, right now there's about, uh, there's about 2 billion, uh, parking spots in the country, right? So we're doing uh, one billion, uh, which is somewhere between I'm trying to remember four and eight. Uh, uh, I forgot now the numbers. There's a lot of parking. <laughs> 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 um, so there's a ton of parking in the country. The big thing is that now if we do this, we no longer need the, the uh, parking spot. How many of you all took an Uber or Lyft here? Anyone? All right, one person. Wow, that's great. That's like very sustainable. It's like wonderful here. Um, so for all those 4.2 billion trips, someone didn't have to park their car. So one of the huge parts of this new mobility piece is we don't have to park our cars. So it's there, there's a bunch of directions that look at when ABs hit um, that we can have up to an 80% reduction in that of parking spot. Right? Because I don't need to put my car in where I get that thing. So if we reduce parking, as we all know from the world that we live in, parking like it takes a ton of what we do, it takes a ton of the urban form that we have, right? So if we can reduce the total number of cars, the total, total, total amount of parking that we have changes a whole lot of things. On the one hand, we can build denser, but I don't have to carry parking, right? First of all, the parking lots I can put the, the development into, and then the development that I have, I don't need to use part of that for parking. One means I can fit more development on any one site, and I don't create the cost of parking. Right, so the cost, the cost for that. So development can get denser, uh, even in suburban areas, like a suburban strip mall or a suburban office park, you do not need all that parking, right? But the developer who's out there is gonna say, what else can I do with that space? How, what can I fill it with? How can I change it? So you can start thinking about potentially semi-urban nodes happening in suburban, right? A huge shift with no need that parking. And then affordability, right? Uh, parking increases the cost of every housing unit in the country. If parking automatically uh, associated with it, it happens in a whole lot of places around the country. So if you don't have to carry parking, fantastic opportunity for uh, reducing overall cost of housing. Um, in urban areas, how much parking is there? Well, there's not a ton of it. So that's all right. You know, all this area, fantastic. We can in these places, great development opportunities. We can put parks in these areas. We can put all kinds of open space. Um, in suburban areas, holy moly, there's a lot more parking, right? So the first perfect picture was Portland. This is Gresham, which is at the suburb of Portland. There's a lot of parking, right? So if we don't need this anymore, all this will get redeveloped. How can we transform our urban and urban communities with all of a sudden this added space? At the same time, though, we have the uh, think about economic impact of what we have on this. We just increase the supply of developable land tremendously potentially for a short amount of time without changing what the demand is, right? So what happens to prices when you increase supply or change demand? It drops, right? So what happens when all this land is available? And we just you know, went from five or you know, five percent uh, uh, available land to you know twenty or twenty five percent of the land, right? Prices would drop a lot. Both of the, these last two places are in areas that have huge development pressure. This is Cleveland. Right? Cleveland is not seeing a whole lot of development. It's not a lot of development happening. Look at all the land that now is going to be available for development. This is going to have huge economic implications as well. Uh, so property prices could go down, as will property taxes. Think about what happens to city budgets 
that are going to follow this way. Um, I'm going to do another quick example here. So in street design, if we think about this is a, a study we did to look at kind of the range changes that might happen. I'm just going to go through this really quickly uh, with new mobility. So there's everything from one, we don't need parking in front of buildings. So the buildings can actually come up and touch the street, even in suburban areas, right? It's a whole shift that happens between the and it's been fine for a long time. We don't need parking on the street probably either. So that's for all the work we've ever done on street design, where available right of way is the like biggest hurdle, uh, right? All of a sudden, have available right of way. What are we going to use that for? Right? Um, we now need this new thing called TNC transportation network companies pick up and drop off traffic, right? Some places have a whole lot of volume of pick up and drop off. Where does this happen on the street? How do we manage the curbside uh, um, uh, access to that? Um, and, and you know, big question for us for each one of these pick up and drop off spaces I have, how much parking did that replace? How much park, less parking do I need to build? Chandler, right now, is one of the one place in the country that has code that actually says you can reduce your park, minimum parking ratios by up to 40% if you provide pick up and drop off. Right? It's a huge shift. Uh, delivery lockers happening both in public, both inside buildings and outside of buildings. Um, uh, you know, track safety of the security of packages is a huge question of organizing that. In New York City, I don't know if you saw this a couple of weeks ago, it came out of the New York Times. 90,000 packages are lost or stolen every day in New York City. Mm -hmm. I talked to someone who works in trade logistics uh, research, and they're like, oh, yeah, I think that's actually wrong. Like, <laughs> not, we couldn't believe it. Right? So, security is going to be a big question for that. Micro mobility, uh, both storage and, and, and parking. Where do you put scooters? Where do you put the, the shared bikes? How do you charge them? Uh, how do we organize that on the street? That's a big issue we're going to have to be dealing with. Uh, there's just a ton of competition for this type of space. Right, so where um, where is the the, uh, the scooters happening? The clutter that happens with that? How do we make sure you know they really aren't tripping over these things? And it's not a hazard. Uh, how do we make sure that someone who's at a TNC is not biking, uh, parking in the bike lane or picking up and dropping the bike lane? It makes me so angry when I'm around them. Right, and then there's all the safety that happens with um, uh, with e cops. Tons and tons of deliveries having to do with those things. The last big point I want to make is that. One of the things for designers to think about is that there's a huge opportunity here for the importance of design. Right? So if this new world that we're going for is upending a lot of things and transportation is getting easier and we're ordering more things online, well, most of our commodities are going online, where are we going to spend time? Why? You know, I'm not going to go spend time in the shopping area that sells cups because I can order them. Right? So what it's about I think it's a huge argument for we speak to client developers that design actually becomes much, much important, much, much more important. That the places that we design, the quality design, is what's really going to draw people to create fun. Uh, and that location by itself might be diminishing in how important it is. I think there's a, a really big argument to be making with, uh, with clients. So, the big points here are one, AVs, autonomous vehicles, new mobility, uh, mobility of service, which is um, kind of the what a piece of new ability to explain, but they're not transportation issues, right? These are everything. These are going to affect all parts of our cities, how we're organized, where we live, where we spend our time, uh, have economic impacts. The same way that e commerce is not a retail issue, e commerce is affecting all of our uh, lives in cities and affecting how we organize these and how we get around. Um, so we need to make sure one, that we're addressing these things, and two, that we're bringing them into the work that we're doing in the design team. So, at Urban is the next, we do a whole lot of work. We do research on these topics. We do um, uh, outreach on these. So we do a, a, a conference every year with uh, and then we do uh, consulting work on this. Uh, I left on all the most of the chairs that the people are back there more fun uh, of this framework that we've developed to help people think through cities, private sector, public sector, uh, think about how the impacts are going to be um, affecting different parts and different aspects of the city. So I hope you can use that. Um, we are. Uh, we have a website, urbanfx.org, and we're launching tomorrow an enormous resource called the Nexus, which more or less takes all of this that you see here, all the different pieces, and organizes the research that exists out there, current state of thinking, and, and how to think about each one of these things on one site. And it has a whole bunch of resources, also on pilots that are going on around the country. It's got fact sheets on what's going on with TNCs. If you want to go talk to your client, or you can go to talk to a city, um, uh, city council. Uh, it 
it's a resource for you that we also have slides that are going to be there. We make slides to that grab this topic. So take a look at urbanfluence.org. Um, we also run a conference every year. It's actually the 13th through the 15th, 14th, 15th of the main conference. There's three, three workshops in uh, Oregon. We do that with in partnership with the American Planning Association, with ASLA actually, uh, with um, ULI, and with um, uh, AIA. And that is as well. It's a place where people are coming together to talk about these issues. We're going to have to invite you to that. And with that, I guess we'll do questions afterwards. So I'm going to pass on to the next. Absolutely. I'll, I'll stay seated if that's okay. Can everyone see in here? Okay, great. Okay, so um, I'm Sakina Khan. I'm with the DC Office of Planning. I'm the Deputy Director for Citywide Strategy. Uh, my team um, focuses on the synthesis of data and, and spatial research and analysis and policy. Um, and we also work with uh, institutions such as, such as research universities and others to figure out um, what is the, the right planning, what is the right policy, and how do we apply that at the citywide level um, at the, and at the place-based level. The DC Office of Planning, I don't know who's local, who's not, can we, can we get a sense of local, local, okay, so we've got a good number also of, of non-locals, which is great. Um, the DC Office of Planning, uh, looks at, uh, we focus on the long-term growth of our district and we look at it through a couple of lenses. Uh, we prioritize um, inclusion and equity and vibrancy. Uh, we're, we're planning for a place where all residents um, can thrive regardless of, back, of background. Uh, and we focus a lot on um, engagement of our stakeholders. We do the planning at three different levels, at the citywide level, at the neighborhood level, um, and at the, uh, the place-based or the site-specific level. We do have a number of architects and designers in the office, uh, in addition to a large set of, of planners. Um, right now, uh, and what I'm gonna be focusing on mostly, uh, is our comprehensive plan. Uh, update that we are currently uh, in the midst of. The comprehensive plan is the document that um, guides the long-term growth of the city. It's how we balance, or it's how we manage for change, and it's also how we balance competing interests. Uh, the document uh, is, is organized into three uh, parts. The context elements provide uh, the foundation uh, for, for the entire document. Uh, we also have a geographic focus and then we have the citywide elements and if you do happen to go look at this document which right now is about 1600 pages um, probably the chapters that you would be most interested in uh, are the transportation chapter and the urban design chapter um, and possibly a land use and, and others as well but i think those would probably be of, of keen interest what we have tried to do in this current update it was last updated in 2006 so a lot has happened since then uh, what we have tried to do in this current update uh, is to take more of a people-centric focus. Uh, we've also um, elevated our focus on equity and resiliency. Um, some of what we have been doing most recently with respect to the comprehensive plan is re-engaging with stakeholders and making sure um, that how we're updating the plan is, cons is consistent and in line with the values of our stakeholders. And the top three values when we did a survey um, uh, about six to nine months ago uh, with livability, safety, and equity. And these are reflected um, in the changes that we're making to the comprehensive plan. Uh, in terms of transportation, so it's about a 70-page chapter within, within the plan. It is kind of like a, a plan within a plan. Uh, but the major policy themes that we're focusing on uh, are providing safe and sustainable trans transportation. So within that category, we talk about um, Vision Zero, we talk about bike safety, we talk about ped safety um, and, and traffic calming measures. Uh, the, the next theme that we focus on is enhancing multimodal options. Uh, so that includes a focus on transit-oriented development. That includes uh, uh, focusing on all, maids, on, on all modes um, as part of roadway management. Um, and also focusing on um, the person carrying capacity of our transportation infrastructure and trying to move away from a focus just on the vehicle carrying capacity of the infrastructure. Uh, we have a whole section on resp responding to transportation innovations, and this gets to some of what uh, Nico was speaking to uh, regarding AVs. We're also looking at EVs and ride hailing, um, the introduction of ride hailing um, uh, companies uh, as part of that. 
And then promoting transportation equity is a theme uh, that runs throughout the chapter and the entire, uh, the entire comprehensive plan. So in terms of transportation equity, uh, the chapter on transportation starts out with the goal and the, the goal that we had in place uh, promotes a safe, sustainable, efficient multimodal transportation system that serves everyone, residents, visitors, and workers alike, uh, but it didn't include a reference to equity. And so we have made that change uh, right up front and also included policies and actions uh, that speak to equity and equitable access and how the transportation infrastructure needs to serve everyone and also that it shouldn't be a barrier to economic opportunity. And I point this out because in this latest comprehensive plan update, we are trying to do uh, uh, a lot more cross-system planning, so understanding the role or, or how uh, transportation uh, intersects with housing, intersects with health, and intersects with, the, with these other systems, and all work together to either provide opportunity or barriers, and we really want to try and lower those barriers. So in terms of transportation and health equity, uh, which uh, I, I understand was one of the focus of, 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 this, uh, of this panel, um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit um, about uh, how we approach it. So who has heard of the social determinants of health? I don't want to get too technical. Um, but the, so in terms of the social determinants of health, these are the non-clinical factors uh, that impact health outcomes. And in the planning field, and in DC in particular, we, there's a growing um, understanding and recognition of the non-clinical factors uh, in determining how healthy our residents are. So by non-clinical, I mean things such as access to, uh, to uh, good food, to healthy food, uh, the quality of the uh, uh, transportation infrastructure that allows you to walk to things, your access to jobs and, and childcare and things like that. So it's not about the access to, to your doctor per se, but it's more about how you get there and all the other things in the environment. And because there is um, a growing recognition of this, and in fact in DC, those non-clinical factors have an 80% impact on your health outcome, which, which is huge. And it's a lot larger than any of us, at least in planning, had realized. And because of that, we have um, incorporated an understanding of health equity into our comprehensive plan. And we have a lot of policies and actions around it. And we also think about how health equity intersects with other systems, particularly transportation, because so much of, of what we think about when we're planning for transportation uh, speaks to accessibility. And what we're finding, and this is a, this is a general statement, but that low-income communities tend to lack equitable access to transportation. And because of that, and because of the lower rates of physical activity, we see poorer health outcomes in, in our low-income communities. And we need to address for that, and we need to plan for that. So within the comprehensive plan, we're trying to make some policy and planning moves that address this and provide for more equitable transportation that then allows people to access um, these things such as healthcare and grocery stores and childcare. And I say that, I, I point that out because I think as planners and designers and architects and landscape architects, we all have a role in figuring out how we can overcome what has been a chronic and historical and systemic issue uh, that once, now that we have the data and we understand how we can, we understand the importance of, of our roles, we can, we can work to change that. So um, just to give you a couple examples of some transportation equity projects um, uh, or pilots in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, that try to promote accessibility, we have a government taxi to rails pilot program, uh, which connects residents in Ward 7 and 8, which are which, um, where we see lower, um, lower incomes. Um, initially, this project was to, to help provide uh, increased access uh, to get to Metro, but now it has been expanded um, to access uh, provide access to important civic infrastructure um, places and facilities such as grocery stores, libraries, pools, and recreation centers. Uh, we also have a capital bike share program, uh, which provides uh, a reduced rate uh, to low-income residents. It's $5 in terms of annual membership as, as compared to an $85 annual fee, so it's quite a heavy subsidy. But it's important to recognize that these are pilots. Um, these don't necessarily solve for uh, long-term and, and kind of more uh, entrenched transportation issues and that we need to learn and revisit um, uh, uh, how we approach uh, transportation equity, particularly with respect to our um, low-income communities. 
Um, I wanted to touch on transportation equity and design since I think we have a, a room full of, full of designers. Uh, so in the transportation element of the comprehensive plan, we also have a section on placemaking uh, that, that focuses on uh, the associated transportation features. Uh, so not just the roadway, but the medians, the sidewalks, the curbs, uh, uh, where we can, uh, if we have the right approach, uh, we can make them more active and more livable. Um, and we recently, we did a lot of placemaking work and that's, that, that could be the topic of a whole nother presentation, a lot of creative placemaking work. And out of that experience, we developed a, a public space activation and stu stewardship guide, which is on our website. Mm -hmm. And it provides guidance on um, how you can go about activating uh, public space um, and also the different types of activation. There's a whole range of different types of activation that we have been experimenting with and that we wanted to, um, to share with, with stakeholders and also what the process is. I don't know um, uh, in terms of your specific jurisdiction or city, but we found when we were doing our creative placemaking work that trying to navigate um, the process for getting uh, approval for doing even temporary um, activations was, was actually uh, more, more challenging than we thought. And because of that experience, we went ahead and, and, and developed this activation guide. Um, I wanted to touch on emerging transportation. Uh, Nico had touched on it. That's actually how we met. I think I chased you down the hallway because you were one of the, <laughs> the few researchers um, who presented at the American Planning Association conference a few years ago, who was looking at the land use implications of autonomous vehicles. And as we think about this technology, and the transformative nature of it, not just with respect to the transportation field, but also how it affects cities in their entirety and how we live and how we access the city. Uh, we needed to um, pull on what we could as we, made, as we did the updates to the comprehensive plan. And so the comprehensive plan um, has a whole new section on uh, emerging technology that deals with AVs, EVs, and um, what, some of the things that we focus on with respect to autonomous vehicles are that these should be shared rides, um, that we should not be trying to uh, focus on uh, zero or single occupancy rides, uh, that we need to be thinking about um, the infrastructure uh, that goes along with autonomous vehicles and the changes and, and those considerations um, with respect to land use and, and curbside management, uh, that we need to be thinking about how autonomous vehicles are supplemental um, to existing uh, transportation networks, particularly transit and, and pedestrian and bicycle facilities, so how, that, how it layers on. Um, some of what we have uh, pointed to in terms of further work that we need to do is around um, uh, better data sharing, uh, better consideration of those land use implications as we, as we understand more um, when and how autonomous vehicles will, will come to scale um, in cities such as the district. We have in place a platform, which is a working group that is looking at some of these issues, um, particularly in terms of safety, equity, uh, efficiency, and sustainability. And this working group um, uh, helped develop a partnership uh, with Ford, which is currently um, testing autonomous vehicles, uh, in, in, which will begin testing, but right now is in, a, is in the mapping mode. Um, so mapping all the streets so that the data is there to then um, uh, begin uh, testing uh, uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, so that is happening right now. And as we look ahead, some of the considerations that we're thinking about um, a land use at a city level, but also at a regional level. Um, there's a study uh, that a local group has, has undertaken, um, which uh, is looking at, at, at those land use considerations. And will this create, will this lead to, will adoption of autonomous vehicles lead to more info development or will we be creating sprawl? And that's a, that, that is a major concern. Uh, but now that we know that it could be, uh, that that could be a future, we need to try and like plan, a, plan for that or plan against it. Um, what happens with all the, the parking um, that autonomous vehicles will not be needing but are currently in place um, in, in cities such as, such as the district? What happens when, uh, in terms of curbside management? Actually, I think uh, it will help uh, if the introduction of autonomous vehicles. If we manage it carefully, it will actually free up a lot of uh, the, the curbside and sidewalk space like Nico was, was, was talking about. And then another thing which I think is in its early stages of consideration <coughs> What are the impacts um, in terms of the economy and the jobs 
uh, there are millions of jobs associated with the, uh, the current transportation industry, and that's both freight as well as uh, you know, <coughs> truck drivers, as well as mass transit drivers. So how do we plan for a transition in that sector and the very real economic development implica implications that, that would come about? Um, lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, <coughs> transportation and the nexus with other systems. I'd mentioned that we, in our comprehensive plan update, we are looking at how um, transportation intersects with land use, with, with housing, uh, with design. And one of the um, really critical initiatives that we're focusing on are the housing needs um, in the district. Uh, last year, um, our mayor uh, uh, released a set of targets. Uh, for the introduction and, and development of additional housing um, in the city, with, which included a focus on affordable housing in particular. And this was in line with a regional effort. And as part of this conversation, um, it's not just about the housing and the type of housing and the affordability of that housing, but it's also a discussion about where it is and the accessibility. And so this is where uh, we've been working closely also um, at the regional level with uh, the transportation planners and understanding where we put the housing and ensuring that housing uh, and those residents, uh, particularly at the low income levels, have access uh, to transit and other types of affordable transportation is, is really critical. Um, and so I just wanted to, to plant that seed that, that uh, we all need to be thinking um, in a, in a cross-sectional way, I think, if we're gonna be really smart uh, about the limited uh, resources we have in, in, in cities and other areas. And housing um, is definitely a, a piece of that uh, important conversation. So uh, I think that's it for now. Happy right. to answer any questions later on. All right, everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, so my name's Ken Ray. As you mentioned, I'm a landscape architect. Um, work at a firm called Tool Design. I'm actually located here in uh, Silver Spring to our offices. Uh, we have 17 offices around the country. Um, personally, my background, I have an undergrad in horticulture and then a master's in landscape architecture. And sometimes I wake up and I wonder, how did I end up at a firm that mostly does transportation and bike ped work? Um, which is a side story that we can always, we can talk about over a beer or something later. <laughs> but um, I've used landscape architecture at our mm -hmm. firm to kind of guide our work to really make great streets. And so we've kind of gone beyond just making complete streets and really moving towards streets that are usable, not only by everyone, but you know, that they're doing multiple functions, whether it's for the environment, for transportation, for land use. And our firm is built around, we have engineers, planners, and like I said, LAs, and we do a lot of guides. So if you're at TRB, you probably bump into a couple of our research folks, folks that are doing poster sessions. Um, we're writing the new ASTO guide for the bike part of that document that should be coming out in 2020 so that engineers will have um, guides to, to guide their um, infrastructure implementation of bike, uh, separated bike lanes and, and protected intersections, um, things like that. But then we work for a lot of cities to do complete street guides. So the Boston Complete Street Guide is a great one to refer to um, different manuals around the country. Um, but as I said before, we're really moving beyond just complete streets and trying to do new things with streets. Uh, so this is an example for a street up in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. This is Jackson Street, where we did a road diet, where as everyone, Nico and Skina was mentioning earlier, you know, we have extra space on streets now, whether it's because the volumes didn't show up that were projected to happen, or because modes change, land use changes, streets changes, cities change transit changes and all of a sudden some corridors just make more sense to be used in a multimodal fashion than just for cars so we removed two lanes of travel of traffic off of uh, this road and converted the re that space into these linear uh, streetscape uh, planters and then a porous asphalt bike path and then a new sidewalk so it really became a linear park through the city that's making a loop but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're gonna talk about mobility. And so does everyone's already talked, so I'll go quickly through this because it's, Nico did a great job setting me up. He, <laughs> he, was, he had the stats down and, and we're right there seeing it, uh, cities and developers uh, daily uh, where the paradigm shift is happening. Um, the micro mobility piece, we've been doing bike share planning for since it started. 
And we first started out, of course, with the dock systems. We did the planning for Capital Bike Show here in DC and all over the country. Um, and that was easy. You had a dock, had 10, 15, 20 bikes. You just placed it on the sidewalk. Um, you didn't have to worry about it. Now with micro mobility and whatever you want to call the scooters and everything else that's happening with that light individual transportation where you have these devices that can go anywhere, then we're fighting for curb space. And so finding spots that, as was mentioned before, we're not competing with other spaces, whether it's the sidewalk, um, people riding in the bike lane, you know, where do these belong? How do we provide space, not just for these other modes, but for everyone to work together? And then the end of trip, I think that's what most of my presentation is gonna nail on is, you know, we're working for cities that are trying to figure out where do these devices belong and how can we use this curbside management to get that set in our policy and to work with these companies uh, to get them in, in implemented. And so I'm going to touch on just two quick projects. One's up in Boston. Um, we're developing a guide for them for micro mobility hubs. And we're actually doing a pilot project for eight neighborhoods in Boston to implement what we're calling these micro mobility hubs. I know there's a lot of stuff on the screen. Don't worry about reading all that. The main thing is understanding, you know, it's easy to pull out one or two of these modes and say, oh yeah, we're going to make a streetscape that provides for transit. Or we're going to have some for bike share. But when you start to layer everything that you need a street to do, and Nico and I, we were talking before the presentation, where we are, we're asking a lot of our urban streets, you know, where do deliveries happen? Where do transit happen? The parking, even though there might be TNCs or AVs in the future, you know, they still need a spot to pick up and drop off. And is that defined? Do we just have a space for them? Is it going to be empty the rest of the time? Are there, you know, do we have busy times to do it? You know, is there going to be off peak, on peak? Uh, issues with that or their charging stations. So we started to wrap our head around, you know, what does this new curbside start to look like? And it starts to fill up really quickly. And so, when, you know, again, it's one of those things, especially from a city standpoint, when you're doing policy, it's kind of easier to kind of sit back and be like, okay, yeah, that, that looks right. But then when you actually start to apply it with these goals and similar to what was just touched on about DC. Cities around the country are grappling with these issues of equity, the economy, you know, trying to be good stewards of the climate, and really trying to figure out how do we make access and equitable transportation a function. And so these were these are stats from Boston. These are similar to some of the ones that were uh, listed out earlier, where the number of biking and walking trips, the carpool trips, the Uber, Lyft, uh, TNC trips are definitely on the rise. And here you can see almost the same kind of numbers that we were seeing nationally. This was just in the city of Boston, where when you start to look at that TNC growth, where it goes from 34.9 up to 42, you know, it's just a gradual trend. But of course, there were no numbers, you know, even before that. But we know those numbers have been increasing. You know, it's not like it just appeared in 2017. And those, the blue bikes, that's their capital bike share, city bikes up there. Um, you know, their ridership is also growing. Um, one thing that we have seen in the scooter research that we've been doing and working with different scooter companies is that those are typically different trips. It's not reducing bike trips. It's not like, like I bike, I don't scoot. Not that I wouldn't scoot, but I just would prefer to bike. But folks that start out with a scooter, if that's their first device, then they're, they're sold on that. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why we're seeing the growth of the scooter. <laughs> surpassing the bikes because the bike's always kind of been there and if you know how to bike you use that because that's what you're comfortable with you know in my commuting today all around dc you know i hardly saw very many bikes out but i saw tons of scooters i mean they're everywhere and that's great that's less cars the tourists here love it they can get around pretty efficiently um, but again we're provide space for them and so with those micro mobility hubs that's one piece and like i said we're working on that in boston they're pilots, we're studying them to see how effective they are. And the city of Boston is using that information to decide one, where do they put other hubs for these different you know, micro-mobility um, elements of the street? But two, are they in the right spot and from that equity standpoint, do they need to be in different neighborhoods? Do we need to have them closer to transit stations? Things like that. The second project is actually working for one of the scooter companies. So it was Spin. And so Spin is a company around, um, they're owned by Ford. So you know, Ford, Uber owns Jump, that's the red bikes and red scooters you see around. You know, there's usually some funding and some mechanisms behind a lot of these companies to financially make them stable. And when they, so this was in San Francisco that this particular 
literature studies on. Um, and the San Francisco market, SPIN did the research, their, their current program that they set up was to have access, you know, five scooters for every member. So, you know, let's say you have, you know, it's a 20% ratio. So it's not for everyone in San Francisco, that's just for the people that sign up so that you have access to them basically anywhere you are. That was their first stab at it. Um, they had a low income program, so they had a lot of things built in for equity, um, but then, the numbers didn't match. And I'm sure every city in you know, DC I'm sure sees this, that you know, the number of users start to get aggregated to certain you know, demographics. You see barriers of entry, you know, once you start to have it where you have to have a credit card, a cell phone, you know, website access to access your account, things like that start to become barriers, um, especially with low income uh, neighborhoods. And so really the purpose of the reason not the purpose, but one of the main reasons that Spin that reached out to us to come up with this program was to eliminate that corridor and to try to raise the number of users so that that ratio of 20% could be a better attainable goal. And so, again, this is more policy, not necessarily design related, but really we we're using these five things as our kind of values or our guiding principles um, to get this goal met. And then using these business opportunities, again, to kind of broaden that corridor and to make it more accessible for other users um, across the board. And so in this project, we had, like I said, this was research and more planning based, but then from the design side, we started to work with them on different uh, options, kind of taking what we had learned in Boston and rolling it into an application in San Francisco. And so we had two different types of stations. One that's a neighborhood station, so much smaller scale. Um, you know, they're the typical scooters like you see around the city where they're free to move anywhere. You know, they could be anywhere on the sidewalk, but we wanted to try to gather them in certain areas and incentivize that. So trying to geofence or have areas identified uh, for them to be and making some, some, you know, some locales that made sense in the neighborhood so that they were easier for the, the, the people in the neighborhood to use them. So it really broke down that barrier. People knew where they would be but these are very low tech. You know, this type of application is not near as robust as the hubs that we were doing in Boston, or that I'm gonna show you next. Um, so the micromobility type hub, the bigger mobility hub, but again, this was both just for scooter, but could be broadened to other things that could be one of the tools in that broader toolkit of things like we're doing in Boston. It's kind of a little bigger piece where you have like the kiosk type device. This allows folks that, again, maybe don't have a cell phone or have access to a computer, but can go up to this, can use it, can get a number. You know, one of the things that we're working on from the policy standpoint, that was some of the other recommendations, was to have other options for folks to go online and to get a number or some kind of pass to be able to use this device. So that then they can go up to stations like this, swipe their card, punch in their number, however to access the device, and then that way have an equitable way of being able to use it. And so again, Usually when I'm traveling to places, you know, we call it a street fight because it ends up being a street fight. We're looking for space on the street to put all this stuff. Um, so, you know, this is just part of what transportation planning and landscape architects get to play in if you're in the transportation side of things. But it's not just, you know, the cars are always, I hate to say they're always taken care of, but that curb to curb space is kind of always set. It's that curb to building public realm that I think micromobility and these emerging trends are really really playing a heavy role in. All right, well, thank you to all our speakers this evening. <laughs> Absolutely great. Uh, I have a couple things just to sort of get us going here, but um, by show of hands, um, how many of you um, are currently dealing with these issues in your work? So a couple, okay. And then also by a show of hands, how many of you have engaged your clients in conversations around social equity and public health? Okay, again, just a kind of couple of you. Well, I think we have questions for each other. I don't know if everyone has those or if I'm the keeper of the questions. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and ask one then. Uh, I'm just gonna pick. Uh, I like the street fight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna steal that one. But, um, but really here, how do, you, uh, how do we really transfer uh, design elements? This is of interest to me, into policy. 
Um, you want me to stop? Yeah. I, I, I would stop by saying, is it the opposite? I mean, policy should maybe translate into design elements. I mean, that, that's kind of, I, I think how we look at it is that, um, you know, in planning, we do it a, a lot of the research, we look at the data, we try and look at implications, and we come up with policy that then frames our planning work and the application of it. And maybe that's just how I think, but I, I, I think that it, 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 it's definitely intertwined with design, but I'm, I'm not sure if I would frame it the way that you did in terms of the order. And if anything, they should happen hand in hand. Um, so we can talk more. Yeah, yeah we can have well, a street fight. Well, well, yeah, right. <laughs> Nico, Ken, you could also speak to, I mean, you're trying to work both simultaneously. Yeah, absolutely. I think. And I'd say one of the things that's really difficult right now is the world is changing so fast with this stuff. I mean, it, it's crazy. I mean, I'd say the last three, year, three years, there's been a ton of this discussion. PRB, PRB's 12, 13, 14,000 people in transportation, many of them are dealing with like pavement issues, but just like pavement issues. Uh, but there's a huge cohort that now is talking about um, these topics in uh, new mobility, micro mobility, ADE. Um, and what you realize is every day there's something new, the conversation that happens, like no one, the stuff comes up faster than people can like publish it or read it, right? So there, there's just tons of stuff. So what, one of the issues that runs into is, so if I'm interested in the end, like what's the street going to look like? How, how much should I design it? We can't have policy that's too restrictive because all the rules are changing, right? Or like all the needs I'd say are changing. So if you, you know, went through a really comprehensive, like these are going to be our street design guidelines, you know, two years ago, you probably don't have anything about scooters, like zero about scooters, right? And now scooters are this enormous thing all over the place. So to me, it points to from the policy side, you have to, be really clear about uh, overall principles, like what is it you're trying to get to? Um, and then you have to be specific where you can be, but then also be flexible for what are these different pieces that are gonna come in and start to talk about stuff. Yeah, I would say that flexibility piece is the key for the plans, mm -hmm. you know, but I agree. I don't think else on policy other than, you, you wonder on the scale, you know, that'd be the only thing, you know, we see a lot of site by site, Type stuff, you know, as far as design reviews and things coming in as you know, developer based and you know, getting more of that's where sector plans and things like that help a lot. But even that, as far as the things being outdated as soon as they're published, um, having that flexibility and letting people understand that those things are guidelines, they're not you know, strict, you know, must do's, that you know, there is some flexibility in there and having that flexibility to review and reassess, you know, once things are being implemented. I'll add two other thoughts. One of them is, I think it's really important to have the public sector and private sector working together. So one of the beautiful things that I like about this conference is that it's got people from government, but it's got all the companies, all the industries there as well. And what was, you know, definitely with the arrival of Uber and Lyft, it was more of a combative relationship. And then with the explosion of scooters, it was an extremely combative relationship. I think there's been uh, characterize it like a reckoning going on right now, right? So Uber's and Lyft's IPOs went horribly. Um, scooter companies are are closing down, or are, some of them are booming, but also they're pulling back from some cities that aren't profitable. So there's a there's a whole new level of humility, which is fantastic, which I think opens up the door for much better, uh, more constructive conversations because cities don't exactly know what the needs are of some of these companies, right? And companies often don't have any idea, bizarrely, don't have any idea what the city's goals are, what they're trying to get to, right? The, a lot of times in the last few years, the company's like, their main goal is like, how do I get my product on your street, right? As opposed to just working with the city saying like, all right, what we're really interested in is like these few like outcomes we'd like to do. How can we work together? So I would say generally, like having a, a more open conversation between groups, let, not, let it, not having it be either compatible or transactional. The other piece that I think uh, was just mentioned is really thinking about, and DC does this fantastically, I think, is thinking about pilots. So testing things out, trying with using projects to try something out and, and both <coughs> in full scale, but also just like as a quick and dirty thing. Right? Let's just put paint out and figure out what this could be and let's see how people use it. Because it is like no time in my professional 
career ever, but things are changing really quick. So we can't just say, oh, this is what we've done. Let's try that thing now. Or let's let's, let's do that thing again. Right? Let's try it. There's this new thing. It's weird. All right. There's like a thousand different ways to deal with it. Let's try something out. Let's see how people respond. And then let's use that as, as a habit that we can take. And, and the how people use it question is critical. And it's how you get to a more equitable outcome is by focusing on people. And for a lot of us in the planning and design professions for a long time, we started with the built environment focus, um, with, which leads to a different set of outcomes. But if you start with people, and we, we in addition to pilots, we've also, um, we have something called a, a, a public uh, life uh, field, field of work, which I think was actually um, uh, inspired by a, a design firm that, that uh, uh, folks might know of. Um, but it is really focusing on how people use space and, and starting with that um, rather than focusing on uh, the platform or the transportation infrastructure itself. But it is a shift and we've tried to make that shift in our comprehensive plan. Uh, but in a, in a lot of professions, I think it represents quite a dramatic shift is to start with people. Um, but I think that's an important part of the conversation. So now, because yes, we don't have a whole lot more time. I see Kimberly first, let's ask your question. And yeah, then. I, I don't know if it's, I actually have a question here, but it's kind of a, a comment and observation. Um, I work for Texas Department of Transportation in Fort Worth. And I think if I remember correctly, data spread on Kirby Plaza to the health and design. And so I thought it was interesting you talked about policy to come first and then green and design. And that's a case where that was happening in the public sector. But then there was this, there was a direction that was happening, and then there was this um, the grassroots out, effort outcry from the public saying, "Whoa, this is this is important to us. We want to try to do, incorporate it into the bigger picture, and we don't want it to go away." And so um, then the private sector was brought in to do these direct and kind of look at it and look at how people were using it. And I remember it though that we would do it again. Um, you know, the greatest title ever for an engineer that is. Livable, livable transportation engineer. And I, I want all of my engineers that I work with to adopt that title. But that was 2017. There, when there were no scooters, there was nothing else. So just the, I guess I just want to reiterate things are moving so quickly that the flexibility and the working together and I don't know if your community is at first that maybe we're on a on a pattern or a, a path that maybe does need once we start getting more input, realize that that may need to go a different direction and just we'll see that. But then also have the flexibility to, you know, a year later, two years later, that now there are all these other elements. And I remember you guys were doing such a great job of trying to get um, the local entity type to look beyond that because there's a lot of amazing development that's happening in our brown area. And how do we link that? Well, we're not really worried about that. We're just worried about this. So when you are talking about site by site by site, it's we need more people, like all of this in the brand. And I'm a landscape architect with a master's in urban planning. So I, I mean, work with private sector, come back to the public sector, and it's just, it's, it is changing quickly. So I, I appreciate all of you getting this message out. So like I said, I don't know if I have a question or just wanted to commit to you on that effort because it's not easy. And I, I saw these guys in this meeting saying, wait, we've got this whole either island built and just happening here. Right across the river. <laughs> oh, that's on that's outside of part of you know, property line. So anyway, thank you for all of you doing work together. So and just Yes, I would just encourage you to continue that and not worry about who starts what first, but let's all let's just get it done. But yeah, so, so I, I absolutely think this is like an all hands on deck moment. So yeah. I've done like two decades worth of work on sustainable urban design. That's like what I've done mostly in my life. And we started looking at this stuff four years ago. It was this as an academic, oh, hey, there's no one looking at these impacts of these. There's tons of people working on transportation, but what about all this impact on the city in the first place? Wow, there's no one doing this. This is great. And like literally a month later, I was like, holy crap, there's no one doing this. We like everyone needs to pay attention. Like this is going to affect for everything I've ever wanted to have happen in sustainability. Like 
it's a risk. Like this could go really, really poorly, right? So we call it the attention. Mm -hmm. I, would, I, think I would love that you all organize this. Uh, is I feel honestly like designers, I'll put landscape architects, architects, and designer are behind the curve, right? So I think everyone's behind the curve. We're much more behind the curve. So planners are looking for it because it's there. Developers are just starting, right? And I feel like designers, we are, we have not grabbed it. We've not educated ourselves about what the issues are, and we've not educated ourselves or experimented to figure out what are the potential design implications specifically, and what can we be doing about them. And so I love the opportunity to talk with all of you and with the, mm -hmm. with the national conference as well, uh, to because it, it, we have to understand this stuff. And I think there's opportunities both for us to shape that conversation, but also bring it back to our clients. For the clients mm -hmm. that are not thinking about this, this is a great opportunity. You, you are a great kind of a, a, a shape of the conversation with them. And, and I think just to build on that, like my aha moment was probably a few years ago, and that's when I, when I found you. Um, because it dawned on me at the time that we uh, were approving projects, and I'm talking about both um, uh, uh, buildings, but also infrastructure projects that would have a lifetime of at least 30 to 50 years. And yet we were going through such transformation uh, when it came to transportation and technology uh, that we were, we were looking at what, what could be a huge disconnect between what we have built and how we want to live and what we have in terms of, of, of transportation options. And so along those lines, uh, we really needed to, to start to try and understand uh, the land use implications, particularly of autonomous vehicles. But to do that, uh, we also needed to think about what are our values as a city and what do we care about and, and what do we want to um, uh, include as principles. And I think that's where to your earlier question, um, it was important for us to think about uh, equity and opportunity and sustainability and for those and resiliency and for those to then shape how we were going to approach uh, policy planning and projects. So I have an aha moment as well and my committee knows this. We did a, uh, a workshop on a Sunday at TRB on, called to tree or not to tree. Am I right, Greg? Yeah. And we had Federal Highway up there. We had several uh, experts on you know, right of way and trees. And I got up to the microphone and said, you know, when we have autonomous vehicles, we don't have to worry about the clear recovery zone anymore. We can plant those trees and these cars aren't going to hit them. And what did they say? Oh, it's never going to happen. And nobody, you know, it was like poo pooed me. Literally, I sat down thinking, oh, what? Because I thought this is, we got we to gotta rethink all of this. So that was mine. And uh, I keep pushing it a little bit at a time. Thank you, Ellen, on board as well. <laughs> okay, wait, uh, Ray was next, I'm sorry, and then we'll go on. So, Nico, I'm gonna follow up with you later. I'm Ray Willard, Washington State DOT. I'm a, I consider myself a manage, landscape management landscape architect. So I've been working with maintenance guys for the last 25 years, trying to convince them that there's a better way to take care of the roadside. So, but when it comes to urban development and, and going towards more of an urban ecology, uh, the thing I saw, I mean, look at all that parking space. The pressure is to develop it to the max, and I'm all for high density, you know, cluster development. But what about green space? I mean, look at all that space that can be converted to a permanent green space that becomes a carbon sink in the middle of the city. Absolutely. So I, mean, I, I feel like this is a, it's like we get the wild part, right? So yeah. pick your area of the city. Everything that's parking, what's lacking? Like what's lacking in your city? I mean, that's parking now can fill that. Need. So if you've got a density problem, bring density. If you've got a retail problem, then you have an open space problem, here's an opportunity for open space, which could be like entire blocks, right, uh, of this stuff. So this is the big question is, what are you going to, what you city are you going to be um, uh, promoting, pushing, trying to have happen with that space when it happens? Who's got control of that space? What are the policies around there that, that, that uh, are going to be governing that? How do we make sure, I think about this a lot with street design, um, you know, let's say we don't need parking lanes or like the, the, the uh, on street park anymore. Oh my God, like space is available. Do you know how many like bike lanes we can put in this or, you know, like the, um, the, put a, a stormwater management systems in there? How are we gonna decide that? Well, the idea is now, before all that stuff is available, to work with cities to set priorities and say, ah, you know what, what's really most important? We like want pedestrians before we want more cars, right? We want like stormwater facilities and we want equity facilities. We want, 
right? So if you set those policies now, when that space becomes available, then the city can be like, well, we've gone through this large planning process. When space becomes available, these are the types of things that we're going to do, right? If you wait until that space is, becomes available, and the truth is that the autonomous vehicles we can talk about this, but a whole lot of the data, as we look at what's already happening with Uber and Lyft and PNCs, mm -hmm. is that this future, there's tons more congestion, right? The car, the, an AV future, let's say we get to an AV 100% AV future, the car lanes can be much more narrow, right? These cars are much more control, but there's a ton more cars on the street. There's less overall cars, but at any one moment, there's more cars on the street. Um, so um, as that happens, there will be pressure to say, well, let's put another lane in. Let's like use this for you know continuing that that trend. So like now is a great time to work with cities to figure out like set your priorities, what what additional space would be important. It's so hard to fight against the economic incentive there though to build out a site with maximum economic potential mm -hmm. rather than with maximum ecosystem services potential. Yeah. Yeah, the, the developers we work with, just real quickly, yeah. I was gonna say we're really trying to educate and encourage them to think more like city planners because they don't realize it usually because they've been working the same way for the last however many years, 20, 50 years that, you know, it's about building, it's about FFB, you know, they're all you know, mm -hmm. really worried about how much they can cram into their site. But most of the time they've assembled property, they own several blocks, maybe they just have a block, but they need to think about it instead of internalizing everything and having everything on their little fee film that, as you mentioned, a green space along one edge or a square corner that's a plaza or some kind of public open space can actually raise the value of their property and that edge and so you really have to sell them on dollars and cents of doing that but my joke is always where if people that come to move into your new building where are they going to walk their dog if there's nothing but asphalt and concrete everywhere you know the value of your place isn't as enticing as it is if you have a nice green space, a nice park within walking distance. And it's that not relying necessarily on the city or other agencies to provide that, you know, hey guys, you want some skin in the game, you'll actually reap the reward later, but it is using that space more efficiently, like you said, for green space and for development. So how many more questions can we take, Katie? I don't know if there's an issue here, but. Too. Okay. All right. You first. I just want to add quickly to that question. I work for the National Recreation and Parks Association, and we've been working with the Urban Land Institute on parks and um, real estate. Uh, and they have a really good report called The Case for Open Space that I would recommend checking out. Uh, and then the other thing, sort of, to letting developers lead is that then we have all of these really random little pieces of parks as opposed mm. to a cohesive city strategy. So I would encourage um, policy that helps us um, navigate developers to a future where parts and open space is part of their contribution to the city or part of their development. And having equitable parks, you know, having parks that are high quality, that are accessible for not just the people living in that building, but exactly. you know, not tucked in in the middle. <laughs> I know, for instance, in, in Portland, they did an analysis of uh, proximity to parks, like how what neighborhoods are park for, we'll say, and um, that is a great analysis to make. As all of a sudden, all this parking land comes available, right? You can just say, like, all right, well, you know, these neighborhoods are doing fine. These neighborhoods, we know as a policy, and we as a study we did, and as a policy that we've got, that this this part of the the city needs more parks. All right, land becomes available. Well, this is a priority for us. Um. Beverly next, and I know you were waiting, so we'll get you to it. Yes, Beverly. Uh, Beverly Story, Texas a and Transportation Institute. A couple of quick questions here. Who in their lifetime ever thought they'd be doing a scooter? <laughs> 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 yeah, really. <laughs> the other thing, how many people have actually uh, been passenger at an AV? Okay. Texas A&M University just put one on through TTI. And it does a loop around campus and it's an AV. And it's it's been pretty successful. You know, it follows a, a single loop around there. You can get off, you can get off. It seems to be working quite successfully. They've also implemented the bike program, the bike sharing. The first vendor that came in with the bike sharing, I can send you pictures of a dozen bikes lined up on the rooftops and you know uh, piled up in the in corners of the sidewalk and in building entryways and yeah it was a real problem with the vendor. So in Texas A&M University of 65,000 students, 
Okay, so it's a lot of kids on bikes and all of that. Change the vendors seem to help tremendously. They kind of caught up on taking care of the actual bikes, you know, putting them in the trucks, getting out of the way, all that kind of thing. But it was it was problematic when they first put it in. And I think you're going to start in with students. So I'll let you know how that works out. <laughs> so but it is it is a learning curve when you start implementing these programs. They thought they had it down and then exactly what you expect and it's like Oh, holy cow. I'll, I'll say to with the scooters coming and for anyone else, can you want any guidance or help or like just you know, point your people and some documents of good scooter policy? We work with a lot of cities uh, mm -hmm. and can help you with that. So there's a there's been a lot of uh, scars, uh, miss miss missed opportunities and the misguided uh, uh, the code and the regulation. So we can help yeah. with that. That's those things sound like a really good idea on paper. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why it's called planning. You know, you yeah. <laughs> plan ahead and don't let the change happen to you. You, you right. know, control the change. Okay, well. you get the last question. So this work assumes that there will be less cars. And I can see that happening in the city yes. center dense areas, but in the suburbs. Yes. How, how why do we think that people in the suburbs will not want to have fun paid with their own? Okay. So I'll take a first pass, but if you want. So the it's not exactly like that. So there it will be less, the overall fleet of cars that exist in the country will reduce. Right. So right now, how many of you own cars? Right? What's your car doing right now? Park. Right. So five percent of the time we use our car, ninety percent of the time to sit. There. So it's not difficult to imagine a slightly more efficient model. So think about an Uber car, or a Lyft car, right? They're being used maybe like fifty percent of the time. So think about that with AVs. We'll have even more you will So we could have let's say like a fifth the number of cars that exist in the entire country and have the same number of trips we do. Because just because our trans just because the system we have right now is so crazy efficient, right? We pay twenty to fifty thousand dollars for this thing that we only use five percent of the time. So there'll be less overall fleet of cars, more cars on the road at any one time. So there's if you look at what's happening with Uber and Lyft, it's huge trip generation. Right? So trips that we would have done on transit or walking. <laughs> We're now doing on uh, on Uber and Lyft, and trips that we wouldn't have done, we're now doing on the road. So we're increasing uh, trips overall. Um, in terms of uh, there being more or less trips in the suburbs, I, I think there's actually going to be more trips in the suburbs. And I didn't talk about this, but there's a huge incentive with when you have autonomous vehicles to have even bigger metropolitan footprints, right? So average time of commute in the country right now is 26 minutes, right? So that means on average, we're all willing to use 26 minutes of like grabbing the wheel and like paying attention to the road, right? So now, in 26 minutes, I can go further if the babies will be more efficient on the freeway. And I don't have to do this. I could be like doing this or like watch a movie or eat, do a million, hang out with my kids, whatever. So maybe I'm willing to do 30 or 35 minutes, right? So there's a huge, if I want like cheaper land or open space, or I really want a house in the middle of the woods. It's much easier for me to do that. So there's a huge push for. You know, I would say there's there's a there'll be a lot of pressure for expanded sprawl. So what we saw when the car arrived, you know, from like more or less denser central cities to, right, that could happen again. So I I think there is a future which is kind of ugly with mm. a ton more trips, transportation happening out through those, in those areas. Hopefully it'll be electrified with both the you know fossil fuel, but still I don't think that's a good solution still. So, um, so I think there will be a lot, a lot of, uh, of this happening. The big thing in terms of some stuff we talked about, you don't need to park there, right? So there's more cars that are doing all the stuff. You need staging areas, right? so you'll have to have it somewhere where, you know, when you're off peak, the start the car gets stored, but you don't need the parking right next to where, uh, where you're, 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 where you're getting dropped off. I, just, I, I think that's right. right. Sorry, I'm mean, going to turn it to you. Um, I think one of the concerns is that. An autonomous vehicle future actually has more congestion with it. Um, a lot of it depends on how ABs are introduced, what the business model is, um, and that's part of the reason why I mentioned in our comprehensive plan uh, we are, we are trying to um, encourage uh, shared trips rather than or, or shared autonomous vehicle usage rather than single or zero occupancy because I think there is a danger that we will just see empty AVs 
um, milling around cities and in suburbs uh, with no passengers whatsoever, and we have more trips, we have more congestion, we have more pollution, and all the other things that, that um, are concerning and problematic about it. So we've actually been studying um, different scenarios when it comes to autonomous vehicle adoption um, that looks at these different um, business models. Uh, we're taking, we, we've had to look at the region as a whole because uh, you know, the, the trips uh, cross geographic boundaries. Um, but there's uncertainty, and I think that's another reason why it's so critical that the public sector and the private sector are talking about this and that um, approaches are done in, in partnership so that we don't have uh, bad policy outcomes as the result of new technology that, that could actually be really beneficial and, and provide more equitable access across a, a city or a jurisdiction, uh, but we don't want the, more, the, the higher levels of congestion that could also go along with that. Yeah, I was just going to say, just as a for cities or anybody that's setting the policy for these devices, you don't have to reward the long trip. You, know, you should still incentivize the short trips and having short trips be the easiest and most, whether it's cost or whatever makes it easier for users to do it, to use this device for that and not necessarily incentivize that extra long trip to incentivize sprawl. Um, so I don't know, if, again, I don't know if you clamp down and, you know, just like New York and other places that have, you know, you gotta pay tolls and things and you're, you know, even to go to Dulles, I guess now the, the toll out there is, you know, changes, you know, so, um, you know, that kind of thing can really incentivize or disincentivize AVs just so that it's a part of the mix, but it's maybe it's not the answer for every trip that you still use either your personal vehicle or transit or other things for those longer trips. Um, still ride a bike, you know, or something right there. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ariel. We stayed a little longer than we had planned, but I think it was great discussion. I think we'll be here for a little while longer. I want to thank very much Katie Riddle and the staff at ASLA for providing this for us. They did a lot of work behind the scenes. Uh, they're great staff. Uh, and thank you to ASLA very much for this event tonight. That's it.